Good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazar, and the subject today we are studying is Cambridge O Levels Physics 5054. Today, in this video, uh, I am going to work on some questions which are, are, are supposed to be coming in ATP paper, the paper four of the physics. Uh, this question is called Planning Questions. So this is a booklet which I'm using, which has been issued by the Cambridge. Uh, and this has few questions, uh, which are planning questions. And in these questions, you have to plan uh, an experiment. So the purpose of this booklet is to provide additional practice planning questions and an associated mark scheme is also there. Planning questions have been introduced to Cambridge O-Level Physics 5054 paper three and paper four for first assessment in 2023. In Pakistan, we take uh, paper four, which is which we call alternative to practical ATP paper. Practice questions have been provided to exemplify a range of types of questions which could appear in examinations. A typical marking scheme is also provided. So this is the introduction to this. So let's uh, start. So the Cambridge Assessment International Education. Practice planning questions, Cambridge O-Levels, Physics 5054, to accompany the revised syllabus for the examinations from 2023. So this is that booklet. So here we will have example planning questions and the marking scheme is also in this booklet. I will uh, share the link of this uh, document uh, in the description. And I have also shared the link of this document in my community community posts. And you can download that and you can work in your class on this booklet. So here I will try to give you an idea how to write these answers. So uh, first question coming up on your screen. So this is the very first question which they have given example planning questions. Okay, so there are a few questions given here, which are just an example, how, what type of questions will come. A student states that the distance a toy truck travels along a horizontal floor after rolling down a ramp depends on the mass of the truck. So this is the basic statement. So uh, how much the, once you release a truck on this ramp, so how much it covers the distance here horizontally? That depends upon the mass of the truck. Okay, so we have to plan an experiment to determine whether or not the student is correct. Okay, so figure 1.1 shows an example of the setup. So here we have the following, here we have a ramp, here they have put some blocks to make that ramp. So the more number of books, if you put here, the angle of the ramp will become larger. The ramp will become steeper. If you reduce the blocks, obviously the angle here, that will reduce and the ramp will become less steep. So uh, he says the following apparatus is available, a ramp, a selection of masses, a toy truck blocks to support the masses, any... Uh, and any other apparatus and material usually available in a school physics laboratory, you are not required to do this experiment. In your plan, you should list any additional apparatus needed, explain briefly how you would do the experiment, and state the key variables to control. Uh, draw a table with column headings to show how you would display your readings. You are not required to enter any readings into the table. You may add to the diagram figure 1.1 uh, to help your description. So it's a six marks question and this is these are the things he wants us to add into it. Okay, so let me tell you, uh, the basic thing which we want to show is that uh, if you will change the mass of the truck, and the, the distance covered here will also change. So uh, we have to, we need a few things. One thing, the very first thing is that you will put a mark on the ramp to make sure that each time you release the, um, the truck on the ramp, you release it from the same position. 
So for that purpose, you will put a mark on the ramp. So the, every time the truck is released from the same position. And um, so each time the, the, the angle of the ramp or the number of blocks here, they should remain the same throughout your experiment. Okay, then first of all, release, let's say, empty empty uh, truck and note down how much distance it traveled on the floor. So to measure the distance on the floor, or the horizontal distance traveled by the truck, you need a measuring tape or you can use a meter rule to measure how much the truck has distance, cover the distance. Then you need some masses which are provided in the list. So... Uh, Keep gradually increasing the, the mass of the truck by putting some masses in the truck. And so the mass, the truck will become, um, it will become heavier. But when you put more mass in it and note down how much distance it travels on the floor. So, um, so, so what things uh, you should keep constant, uh, the angle of the ramp, the height of the ramp, the point on the ramp from where you release the truck. And for each mass you can do, you can do it two times, three times, then take the average of the, then take the average of the horizontal distance moved on the floor by the truck. And uh, what kind of table you will make? Uh, you can make a table where you note down the mass of the truck, for example. Uh, and if you want to measure the mass of the truck, you can use an electronic balance also. So, so you know the exact mass of the truck uh, with the loaded masses or, or empty truck or empty truck. So you should have an electronic balance with by which you can measure the uh, mass of the truck. And so in your table, you will have one column uh, for the uh, you know the mass of the truck, which will be in grams and. The second column will be the horizontal distance moved on the floor, and that will be in centimeters. And by comparing the, the mass and the horizontal distance, you can then decide that if the horizontal distance moved on the floor by the truck depends on the mass of the truck or not. So this is the whole planning. Let me show you. I have written this answer. Actually, the answer is are written under my supervision by one of my students, and uh, uh, her name is Aisha. And Aisha Akil has written these. And thank you for uh, thanks to her for helping me out. And if something is missing in her answer, I will I will add here. So, so the question number one, you can say with the help of a marker, mark a fixed point on the top of the ramp, release the truck from the marked point and avoid any push while the release. Mayor horizontal distance the truck travels after the ramp, after the ramp means, with the help of a measuring tape, repeat the experiment by placing different masses on truck. The angle of the ramp and the release position must be kept constant. And the table you have to make is this table, the mass in grams of the truck and the distance moved horizontally in centimeter. So here you see the factors which you have to keep constant, the variables which you have to control. And these, those are the angle of the ramp and the height of the ramp and the position on the ramp from where you from where you release the truck and the rest of the things should also be same same only the mass of the truck should change and the additional material additional apparatus which you will require is the measuring tape or you can use a meter rule and uh, I, you might need a uh, electronic balance to measure the mass of the truck so this is question number one. Hopefully you understand. Let me show you another interesting thing. Here we have uh, and the marking scheme of this question. So here on your screen, the marking scheme of this question number one is showing up. So he says, place truck on the ramp and release my distance trial from bottom of the ramp 
repeat with different masses loaded on the same track. Apparatus is meter rule, measuring tape, control variables, anyone from height, angle of ramp, number of supporting bricks, release position, or height above the bench. Table, uh, table with the clear columns of mass and of distance traveled with the appropriate units in the headings of the table. This is this question is called the planning question of for an experiment, and it is of six marks. And I hope that you have understood the question number one. Okay, so let's go to the next question. This was question number one. Now we are going to the question number two. A student is investigating the force needed to slide a wooden block across a surface. He notices that some blocks need uh, more force to start to slide than other blocks do. He suggests that the amount of force needed depends on the mass of the block. Plan an experiment to determine whether or not the student is correct. So the force needed to sli st start sliding the, the block on a floor or on a, tabel, a table uh, depends upon the mass of the rock, uh, mass of the block, sorry. Uh, figure 2.1 shows parts of the setup. Here we have a, a, a flat block and here we have a hook with it. The following apparatus is available. One lightweight, uh, flat wooden block with a hook fitted, a pulley which can be clamped to a bench, any other apparatus and materials that are usually available in a school physics laboratory. You are not required to do this experiment. In your plan, you should list any additional apparatus needed, draw a clearly labeled diagram of how the apparatus should be arranged, give brief instructions uh, for doing the experiment, Describe any describe any precautions the student should take to ensure repeatable results. Suggest a graph which could be drawn. Okay, so here uh, what you can do uh, you can use uh, uh, you can use a flat block and hook with it uh, uh, a, a meter uh, a newton meter to measure the force. And then uh, with that, uh, on one end of that meter, uh, Newton meter should be hooked with this hook or with this hook. And the other end of the Newton meter, uh, with the help of a thread, uh, the thread should pass on a pulley and that pulley should be clamped to a side of a table. And uh, with that uh, thread hang some known masses. So there you can add masses. And uh, so uh, the, another thing which you need is, uh, I, I, I need, you know, the, the known masses, which I can hang with the pulley uh, to increase the force on this uh, flat block. And uh, I will also need, uh, electronic balance to measure the mass of this block. So what you will do, uh, you will keep increasing the hanging mass with the pulley and you will, uh, you will keep noting down the force which will be showing on the Newton meter and keep increasing uh, slightly, increase the load, increase the load, the hanging load with the pulley and at some point, obviously, the, the, the flat block will start sliding on the table. So before it slides, you have to note down what is the maximum force shown on, on the Newton meter. So uh, once it moves, just note it down. You can repeat this experiment two, three times and then take the average. Then increase the mass of the you this uh, flat block and then do the same procedure note down what is the maximum force shown on the newton meter before this flat block starts moving so this is uh my question uh, my uh i think 
this is how you will do it. Once you have noted down the mass of the block and the maximum force shown on the Newton meter before the block starts sliding, and then you can draw a graph between the force and the mass of that block. And you will, um, I mean, you can put the mass of the block on the x-axis and the force, which uh, the maximum force uh, after which the block starts sliding uh, on the y-axis. And then from there, when you draw the graph between them, you can clearly see the relationship between the mass of this flat block and the force required to slide uh, it on the table. So let me show you uh, my answer and then, okay, so here, I hope you can see this. Uh, this answer has been written by one of my students and obviously she was writing the answers under my supervision. So uh, here we have shown a table, this is a table. And on this table, we have that flat block. And uh, with this hook, we have hooked a Newton meter and on the other side of the Newton, the other end of the Newton meter, uh, we have tied a thread with it. And that thread is passing over a pulley, which has been clamped to the side of the table. And with that thread, we, uh, we have hung uh, uh, um, some masses, some loads, and we know them the load. Okay, so in our lab, physics lab, you know, we have available those loads, which we can hang here. So gradually, I will increase this load. So this Newton meter will show uh, the tension in this string. So uh, in other words, you can say the force which is being applied on this uh, uh, flat block. And I will gradually, slowly, gradually increase this load here. And I will keep an eye, or we will keep an eye on this Newton meter. And so obviously at some point when you're gradually increasing this, the, this block will move. So you have to note down what was the maximum reading shown on that Newton meter before uh, that block started sliding. So just note down that force and do this again and again, and then increase the mass of this block by putting some more masses on it. And then do the same procedure and note down what is the force which is required uh, before it slides to make this slide, okay? So um, I hope you understand the arrangement of this apparatus and the procedure. Attach a Newton meter with the block and pulley by the help of thread. Add known masses to the pulley and measure the force at which the block slides. Repeat experiment with the placing different masses on the block. The surface at which block slides must be same in every experiment. Okay, these are the some variables which need to be controlled. Uh, only one thing should change, that is the mass of that block, okay? The rest of the things should remain same, surface of that table or the angle of the pulley, everything should be same. Additional apparatus needed are a Newton meter, Newton meter is required, and no, known masses are needed, and you might also need the Newton meter, uh, sorry, electronic balance to measure the mass of that uh, flat block. And so every time you know the exact mass, okay? Plot a graph with masses of the block on the x-axis against the force needed to slide the block on the y-axis. And by looking at the shape of that graph, you can tell the relationship between the force needed to slide the block and the mass of the block. So this was question number uh, two, and I hope uh, you understand this question. This is the apparatus, and this is our answer. So uh, if you want to draw the table here, so the table will be, uh, you will make uh, two columns, and in one column, you will note down the mass of the block, and in the other column, you will note down the force which is needed here. And that will be in Newton. The mass will be in grams, okay? So um, very simple. Um, um, you can draw a table here. So, okay, so I hope you understand. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. And the marking scheme is just coming up on your screen. Okay, so here uh, the apparatus, question number two, uh, uh, force meter, which we call Newton meter. 
10 gram and 100 gram masses masses only if clear they are used to change the mass of the block and as weights to the block via the pulley okay so a diagram block uh, walkable means of pulling the and measuring the force method uh, uh, measure force required to make uh, uh, make block slide find mass on pulley required to make block slide repeat uh, for different values of masses so precaution uh, same surface to slide on repeat each measurement and take average same angle of pulley uh, pulling force okay and the graph will be mass on the block versus the force needed to slide i hope you understand this planning question and i hope you can write a better answer than uh, uh, we have written i okay so we are going to the next question and the next question is question number 3 he says the converging or the convex lens used in a school physics laboratory are made with a variety of thickness and have different focal lengths. The focal length F of a lens can be calculated if U, the distance between the object and the lens, and V, the distance between the lens and the image on a screen are known. So the question is F is equals to UV, U multiply V divided by U plus V. And here we have a diagram of a convex lens, and this is the thickness of the lens. Plan an investigation to determine the relationship between the thickness T and the focal length F of converging lens. And figure 3.1 shows the thickness T. The following apparatus is available. Illuminated object, selection of lenses of different thickness, and a lens holder. Screen, a meter rule, 30 centimeter ruler, and uh, two rectangular wooden blocks with the longest side of each block uh, longer than the diameter of the of the lens okay you are not required to do this investigation in your plan you should draw a diagram to show the arrangement of the apparatus labeling u and v explain briefly how you would do the investigation include the measurements you would take explain briefly how you would determine the thickness t of each lens you may draw a diagram if it helps your explanation draw a table with column headings to show how you would display your readings you do not need to use the equation to calculate the focal length you may add to the diagram in the figure 3.1 to help your description so this is the question so so, uh, so you have to do a few things. For example, uh, they are asking you to, let me reduce the size. So, uh, first of all, I, I need, uh, what I will do, I will measure the thickness of the lens I am going to use. So, how you measure the thickness of the lens, you will take the two wooden blocks and with those wooden blocks you will put a scale on the table and between those two, two wooden blocks you will put the lens and then you will measure the distance between the two blocks and that will be the thickness of that lens this is how you will find the thickness of the lens so and then you know it's a very famous experiment we will take an illuminated object the illuminated object can be uh, a bulb and you know normally what we do we put a card in front of the bulb and we make a slit in the card so so only through that slit the light will come and then we put a lens uh, in front of that and then we put a screen so we move the lens and the screen forward backward hit and trial and when we get a very clear and the sharp image on the screen of that illuminated object, so uh, then we will measure the distance between the uh, object and the lens that is called U. Then we measure the distance with the help of a meter rule between the lens and the screen when the image is very sharp. And that we call V. Then we will use this formula, okay, F. To calculate the F, once you know the U and V, you have measured it. 
And then you can use the uh, this for the f, f calculating f that is u v divided by u plus v. So and then use a different uh, lens of different thickness and uh, do the same procedure. Each time you do this uh, with each lens, do it two three times to get different uh, uh, to, to get the focal length three times and then take the average. Okay, so then uh, you can draw the table. The table uh, will be, in the table you will note down the thickness of the lens and then the U value, then the V value, and then you will, uh, F, which will be calculated, and the formula is UV divided by U plus V. So this is how you will decide on that. And then you can look at the table and... Uh, and you can decide uh, that when the thickness of the lens is less say, increasing, so what is happening with the focal length of the lens? So this is the experiment which you have to write down. Okay, so I hope you understand. So this is how you do this. Uh, here we have a light bulb, okay? And here we have a cardboard. And here I have a small slit in it. So through this, the light will come. So this, this, thing, will, this thing will be acting as a, illuminated object here we have a lens which is in a holder and here i have a screen which is also in a holder so the image of this illuminated object will be formed on this screen so you can move the screen forward backward and at some position obviously a clear a sharp and clear and a real image of this uh, will be formed here on the screen when this happens stop everything and then with the help of a meter rule or a scale, measure the distance between the lens and the object, and the, that will be U, and the lens and the screen, that will be V. So then you can note them in a table, and you can use the formula F is equal to UV divided by U plus V. And then um, you can uh, with you can see I have drawn this. This is how you you put the lens between the two blocks, and with the help of the scale, measure the distance between these two blocks, and that is equal to the thickness. So for each lens, do this, and then use a different lens of different thickness, and do this procedure again. So then you will have a data where you will have thickness of the lens and the focal length of the lens. And then you can compare them and you can decide that if by changing the thickness, the focal length is changing or not. Okay, so my answer is arrange the apparatus as shown in the diagram. Move the screen forward and backward until a focused sharp image is made on the screen. Then record or measure the values of U and V. U is the distance between the lens and the object. V is the distance between the lens and the screen. Repeat the experiment using different thickness of lens. Calculate the focal length using the formula in every experiment. That formula is this one. You can mention that formula here. That is F is equal to UV divided by U plus V. Okay. So uh, this is how you will measure the thickness of the lens. Place the lens between the two blocks. Measure the different uh, distance between the Two blocks, that is the estimate thickness of the lens. So this is the table which you have to draw, thickness which will thickness of the lens, which will be in centimeters. U is the distance of the object from the lens, and that is in centimeters. And here V is the is the distance between the, the lens and the screen when a sharp image is formed on the screen. And F, you will calculate the formula is given, so you can uh, you can you can uh, you can calculate the F value. So different thickness lenses and different focal lengths will be here. So from these results, then you can conclude that uh, by changing the thickness, if the focal length changes or not, and if by increasing the thickness, the focal length increases or not. So you can find out the relationship between the, okay, so now we are going to the next, uh, uh, I mean the, okay, so question number three here on your screen, 
The question number three, the answer is showing up. This is the marking scheme issued with this booklet. He says, uh, diagram showing object, lens, screen, image in correct order with U and V labeled. Uh, measuring, measure record, calculate U and V and the lens thickness T, repeat with a different lens. Method of obtaining a sharp image by moving the object, lens or screen. Measuring lens thickness, use of blocks either side of lens and measure distance. And table with the column of U, V, U, V, and T with the correct unit. So this is the marking scheme. And I hope that you have understood the question number three, the planning question, which was the example planning question three. Okay, so uh, my dear students, now we are going to the next question. And the next question coming up on your screen is question number four. He says... Uh, Question number four, a student is investigating the factors that affect the height to which a ball bounces when it is dropped. It's a very important thing that the height from which you drop a ball, uh, the height of the bounce depends upon it. Plan an experiment to investigate in detail how the height from which a ball is dropped affects how high it bounces. The following apparatus is available, ball of different materials and sizes, sheets of different types of floor coverings, any other apparatus and materials that are usually available in a school physics laboratory. You are not required to do this experiment. In your plan, you should list any additional apparatus needed, give brief instructions for doing the experiment, describe a precaution the student should take to ensure that measurements of height of bounds are repeatable. Uh, state the key variables to control. Draw a table with column headings to show how to display the readings. You are not required to enter any readings into the table. Explain how to analyze the readings to reach a conclusion. You may draw a diagram if it helps to explain your plan. So uh, this is the question they are asking us and uh, they are asking us to plan an experiment on it. So what I will do, uh, you see, uh, we will uh, take a ball, we will select any ball and uh, then uh, we will take a covering for the floor and uh, you see uh, if the ball and uh, we will take a vertical scale a vertical scale can be a scale, um, a meter rule, which is clamped into a retort stand and which is uh, the, 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 the scale is kept vertical. And you can drop the ball and you can estimate how high is the bounce to get an idea how high is the bounce. If the bounce is too much, so you can put some covering on the floor to reduce the bounce. Because, for example, if I drop a ball and it goes, the bounce is too high, and it goes beyond the height of your uh, vertical, vertical, what you say, vertical uh, rule, uh, then you can change the covering of the floor. But whatever the covering for the floor you have cho you have chosen, and uh, then throughout the experiment you will keep it same. So you will select a certain height from which you will drop the ball. For the vertical, uh, you know, the vertical scale. Uh, from there, decide, for example, you drop the ball from one meter height and then um, make a guess that, uh, make a guess not. The ball will bounce and note down what is the height of that bounce. Then do it two times, three times and take the average. Then drop the same ball, same covering of the floor uh, from a little less height. And then note down what is the height of the bounce. And then again, do the same procedure. Then again, drop the ball from a little less height and note down the height of the bounce. So then draw a table. And in that table, note down what you will note down. You will note down uh, the uh, the height from which you are dropping the ball and the height of the bounce. So the things which you have to keep constant, for example, you have selected a certain ball. So throughout the experiment, you will keep that ball, the same ball. You will use the same ball. 
the covering of the floor should be remain should remain the same same and the other conditions the the conditions of the room that should remain same and you can also, uh, you know, to because of the parallax error, because when the ball is bouncing and you are noting down how high is the bounce, um, the, because the, there will be some distance between the vertical scale and the bouncing ball. So here you have to make a little estimate that how high it went. You, you can never be doing it very accurately. So for this purpose, you can uh, ask one of your students to observe the height of the bounce. And his line of sight must be parallel to the scale. And another thing you can do, you can record by with the help of a camera, you can record that bounce so you can have a better idea. But your camera should also be perpendicular to the vertical scale so to avoid the parallax error and so from once you have the results then you can by looking at the height and height from where the ball is dropped and the height of the bounce you can decide that if the height of the bounce depends upon the height from which the ball is uh, from the from which the ball is dropped so uh, let's have a look at this let me read the statement again student investigation the factors that affect the height to which a ball bounces when it is dropped plan and experiment to investigate real how the height from which the ball is dropped affects how high it bounces you see here he has told us that which variable you are changing the height from where you will drop the ball so here, um, this answer has been written by one of my students, Aisha Akil. Thank you to her. And this answer has been written by under my supervision. I have not actually written this answer. Uh, so if there is some uh, discrepancy, I will tell you here. So attach a meter rule to a wall that is vertical to the ground. Drop the ball of same material from measured heights on the same type of floor covering. Measure the height of first bounce of the ball using a camera use of a video. Repeat the experiment for different heights of release. Make a table with the columns for release height and bounce height. Then draw a suitable graph of uh, drop height against bounce height. So uh, drop height will be on the x-axis and the uh, bounce height will be on the y-axis to analyze the reading to reach a conclusion. So from there, you can conclude what is the relationship between the height of the drop and the height of the bounce. So here is the release height, which will be in centimeters and the bounce height, which will be in the centimeters. And the rest of everything should be kept the same. The material of the ball, the ball itself, uh, the covering of the floor, and the meter rule, and the conditions in the room, temperature, wind, everything. So I hope you understand this uh, experiment. And uh, so this is the, the whole thing showing up on your screen. This is question number four. And I hope you have understood. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. Okay, so here we have the question number. Oh, sorry. Question number four is showing up. It's marking scheme basically showing up. Apparatus, what you need is a meter rule, a measuring tape. Drop the fall uh, ball from measured heights, measured height of the first bounce. Repeat for different heights of release. So precaution you have to take is repeat uh, for each height release and average find the average height of the bounce, measure to same part of the ball each time, measure height of the bounce at eye level, and release without throwing, impeding, without putting force when you release the ball. Don't push the ball downward. Just release it gently. Use of the video or height of the bounce. Control variables, same diameter, same mass, same material ball, same type of the floor covering, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I just touched it. Sorry. And 
table columns for release height and bounce height with the units in the in the headings okay analyze any one from suitable analysis of readings for example find ratio of drop height to bounce height draw a suitable graph of the drop height against the uh, bounce height so from there you can conclude you can make a conclusion so this was uh, question number five i hope you understand now we are going to the next question and the next question coming up on your screen is question number five. So here we have, it says, a student uses an electrical heater to heat a beaker of water. She notices that the time taken to heat the beaker of water changes when the voltage across the heater is changed. Figure 3.1 shows part of her setup. So if you change the voltage, the time needed to uh, heat, uh, heat the water uh, changes okay so here we have that beaker here we have the water this is electric heater so the power of the heater is given by the equation p is equals to vi where v is the potential difference across the heater and i is the current in the heater plan an investigation to determine this is the actual question okay Plan an investigation to determine the relationship between the power produced by an electric heater and the time taken to heat a beaker of water. The following apparatus is available. So we have an ammeter voltmeter and a 0 to 12 volt uh, variable power supply, 230, uh, 250 cubic uh, centimeter beaker, heater, thermometer, stopwatch, any other apparatus and material that are usually available in a school laboratory, physics laboratory, physics. And you are not required to do this investigation. In your plan, you should complete the diagram in figure 3.1 to show the circuit that you would use. Explain briefly how you would do the investigation. State the key variables to control, draw a table with column headings, to show how you would display the readings, you are not required to enter any readings into the table. Explain how you would use the result to reach a conclusion. So, uh, you see, very simple. Uh, uh, we will take uh, water at normal temperature and we will take, let's say, two, 250 cubic uh, centimeter of the water because he's just told us the, yeah, the water. Or you can take five, uh, let's say you can use uh, uh, 200 centimeter cube of water. And then you can use a thermometer to note down the temperature. The water will be at the normal temperature. And then uh, you start, you will put uh, here a voltmeter. And uh, in series with this uh, heater, you will put an ammeter. Ammeter will measure the current, the voltmeter will measure the voltage drop across this, and then you can connect them to a variable power supply. So variable power supply, you can change the voltage, the EMF of the power supply. So, and then start this heater and start noting down the, looking at the thermometer, you start noting down the temperature. You will also need a stopwatch, okay? So when the temperature, for example, when the temperature becomes 40, thermometer is on, the heater is on, when the temperature becomes 40, note down, start your, uh, for this, this is for example, okay? So when the temperature is 40, start your stopwatch. And suppose when the temperature becomes 60, stop the stopwatch. Okay, note down the reading on the voltmeter, ammeter, and now you know the time, uh, required to raise the temperature from 40 to 60. Okay, then uh, uh, you can do it two times and then what you will do. So every time you have to repeat the experiment, you will have to throw away the hot water and put again the same uh, amount of water in the beaker and uh, you have to do that experiment again and with the same voltage or same emf then what you can do and and then uh, by repeating you can take the average uh, average of the time taken uh, to raise the uh, temperature from let's say 40 to 60 
okay so what you will change now you will change the voltage of the battery we call it this emf of the battery because you have a variable power supply so you will change the you will change the uh, voltage emf of the battery and then again then again uh, when the temperature of the water becomes 40 start the stopwatch when the temperature becomes 60 and uh, stop the stopwatch and do this experiment uh, for, for the same voltage, let's say three times. So once you have done this, and then, then we can have, uh, you can draw a table where you will note down uh, the voltage of the battery, the, so the current, the reading which will be coming on the ammeter. So you can calculate the power, power is equals to IV, and the time needed to raise that temperature of the water, a certain amount of the rise in the, a certain change in the temperature. Uh, in, in all the experiments, you should, uh, um, for example, you will be checking that you will be changing the temperature from 40 to 60, for example. Okay, so every time the change in the temperature should be kept same. And you will note down how much time it took. So, so then by noting down the time, the power, you can, you will be able to, you can plot a graph between the power of the heater, uh, P equals to IV. On, on the x-axis, you can take the power provided to the heater on the x-axis and the time required to raise that same amount of the temperature of the water uh, on the y-axis. And from that graph, you can decide on what is the relationship between them. So this is how you will plan it. So let me show you. So uh, here we have, uh, um, unfortunately, this question answer has been written by one of my students. Uh, her name is Aisha Keel, and she has not drawn that diagram. So let me draw here. So you can put a voltmeter here. So this is how you will do this. You will put a voltmeter here. And you can put an ammeter here. Okay. They have asked us to draw the diagram. Okay. And then you will have a variable battery here. This is not a fixed battery. So this is a variable Okay, this voltmeter will tell you how much is the voltage being used here. This ammeter will tell you how much is the current flowing through here. This battery is a variable battery. So put an arrow here. This arrow means that I can change the EMF of this battery. So by changing the EMF of the battery, the voltmeter reading here, the ammeter reading here, they both will change and just note them and you can calculate the power the power electric power used here the formula is power is equals to iv so this will be giving you the voltage value it will be giving you the i value so this is the diagram which you have to make okay so place the thermometer in the beaker meyer v and i to calculate power meyer time using a stopwatch for water temperature increase by a specific amount so uh, this is thing is very important. A specific change in the temperature, and each in each experiment, that initial temperature from where you start the stopwatch and the final temperature where you stop your stopwatch, the the initial and final temperature should be same same in all the experiments. Okay. For example, I told you that always start your stopwatch when the water temperature is forty. This is just an example, and you will stop your stopwatch when the temperature of the water becomes sixty. So um, increase by a specific amount, repeat the experiment with different values of V, how you do this by changing the, the EMF of the uh, variable uh, power supply. In each experiment, use same volume of water with the same initial temperature. So whenever you do this experiment, it means in this series of experiments, every time the water volume should remain the same and the beaker should be the same the thermometer should, everything should be the same and the temperature change which you are trying to measure uh, for, for the temperature the initial temperature and the final temperature should be kept the same so plot a graph this is a table uh, how you will calculate 
uh, note down the voltage, note down the current, and then calculate the power and the time that will come from the stopwatch. Plot graph of the power against the time to make a conclusion. So uh, here you will represent the power on the x-axis and the time on the y-axis. And then by looking at that graph, you can decide that uh, the time, how it depends upon the power given to the heater, the time required to raise the temperature of the water from a certain initial temperature to a certain final temperature. So I hope you understand this question if there are some uh, things missing in this written answer. I have described it to you. Now we will have a look at the marking scheme. And from there, you can also have a good idea how to write, how to plan this experiment. So we have here, uh, we are a circuit diagram, workable correct circuit diagram with the power source and correct symbols for ammeter and voltmeter, okay? The ammeter is always connected in series. The voltmeter is always connected parallel to the apparatus. So method two, uh, so method, there are two marks for it. Measuring, measuring V and I and time for water temperature to increase by a specific amount. Repeating with at least two other values of V or power and or I. Control variables, uh, so what, which things you have to keep same, same. Same starting temperature, same temperature difference, same room temperature. The room temperature should remain same. The starting temperature always should be same. And the final temperature should be same. And the same volume of uh, same mass, same amount of the water should be used. Table clear column for time V and I with appropriate units of uh, power, which will be made in watts. If voltage will be made in volts, I will be made in amps and ampere and the time will be measured in, let's say seconds, or you can take in minutes. Conclusion, uh, plot a graph of power against the time. So this is how you will plan this experiment. Hopefully you understand. Okay, so that was question number five. Okay, so now we are on a question. Uh, this is an example planning questions uh, issued by the Cambridge O-Levels Physics. Uh, so, uh, a teacher tells her class that the resistance of a wire depends on the length of the wire, the type of metal from which the wire is made, and the diameter of the wire. These are the few things on which the resistance of a wire depends. Obviously, the resistance R, capital R, can be calculated by the equation R is equal to V by I, where V is the potential difference across the wire and I is the current through the wire. Plan an investigation for a student to determine how, this is very important. Uh, he says plan an investigation for a student to determine how the resistance, how the resistance of the wire depends on the length of the wire. This is the main sentence, okay? So we will keep uh, the rest of the things will remain same. Only the length of the wire will change and we will check how, how is the resistance changing with the length of the wire. The student will plot and the student will plot a suitable graph. The following apparatus is available. So um, ammeter, voltmeter, power supply, variable resistor, switch connecting leads, uh, resistance, and then we have uh, Resistance wires of different lengths, meter rule. You are not required to do this investigation. In your plan, you should draw a diagram of the circuit to be used to determine the resistance of each wire. Give brief instru instructions for doing the investigation. Suggest suitable lengths of wire. State the key variables to control. Draw a table or tables with column headings to show how to display the readings to enable a suitable graph to be drawn. You are not required to enter any readings into the table. Okay, so uh, how, what, what we will do? This is question number six. So very simple, uh, what we'll do, we will take, uh, let's say one meter length of the resistance wire and with it is the resistance wire, with the help of the, on one end of that resistance wire will be connected to the, to the crocodile clips. It will be connected to 
by the ammeter than to the power supply. The other end of the power supply will also have a flexible wire with it and it will have a crocodile clip. So I will put that second crocodile clip uh, uh, from different parts of the wire. Uh, with the resistance wire, I will put a meter rule. So wherever I put the second crocodile, I know how much length of the resistance wire is being used by the circuit. Okay, so, um, um, for example, for a certain length of the wire, um, switch on uh, uh, the circuit, uh, you have connected an ammeter in series with the wire and you will also have to put a voltmeter, which will be parallel to this wire. And that voltmeter will tell you the voltage drop uh, on the wire and uh, the ammeter will tell you the current flowing through the wire. So note down the reading on the voltmeter, note down the reading on the ammeter, and then you can calculate the resistance of the wire uh, by the formula R is equal to V by I. So we can do that. It's a very simple, straightforward thing. Then you can, the, the second crocodile clip, just put that crocodile grip on a different point on that resistance wire. So now the length of the resistance wire, which will be, which will be, which, which is being used in the circuit, that will change. And then again, calculate the note down the voltmeter reading, note down the ammeter reading, and then calculate the resistance of the wire. So by doing this, you will uh, calculate the the resistance of that length of the wire. So then by plotting a graph. Uh, between the length and the resistance of the wire. When you will plot that, you will know that uh, how the length has affected the resistance of the wire. So this is my description. Let's have a look at the written answer. The answers has been written by one of my very uh, intelligent students. Aisha Akil, she has written these answers. Uh, as you can, if you recognize my handwriting, this is not my handwriting. Thank you. We are thankful to her. Okay, so here we have, here we have the connecting leads. Here we have a crocodile clip. This is that resistance wire. So uh, this crocodile clip has been attached at one end of that resistance wire. And with this resistance wire, I have put a meter rule to know how much length of the wire is being used by this circuit. Here we have an ammeter, here we have a power supply, here we have a switch, and here we have another crocodile clip. This is the second crocodile clip, which is connected with the other side of the battery. So put, for example, you can put this cro crocodile clip here. So this length of the wire is used. If you put it here, this much length of the cro uh, uh, resistance wire is used by the circuit. If I put it here, so this much length of the resistance wire is being used. So you can change the length of the resistance wire uh, through which the current is flowing by changing the position of this crocodile clip. And uh, the length between these two crocodile clips, I can measure with the help of this uh, meter rule. So I need a voltmeter, I need an ammeter, I need this measuring, uh, this meter rule. Okay, so I need these crocodile clips also. Uh, so this is the diagram. Okay, connect. Uh, the, the measured length of wire in the circuit with the help of crocodile clips. Close the switch and measure readings of the ammeter and voltmeter to calculate the resistance. And you can repeat this experiment. Close the switch, open the switch, close the switch. For each length of the wire, do it two times, three times, and then take the average of the resistance. The experiment using different lengths of wire, for example, 10 centimeter, 20 centimeter in every experiment, use the wire of the same material and diameter. So the, these are the variables you, uh, these are the controls uh, which you have, the, you know, the things which you have to keep, keep the same. The material of the wire should be same, the diameter of the wire should be same, uh, the room, the, the pressure of the wire should be kept same. And for this purpose, you know what we do? We, we switch, we close the switch, we take the readings, we, uh, and open the switch. Why? If you keep the switch closed, what will happen? 
the the wire will become very hot the wire will become very very hot when the wire will become hot its temperature will rise obviously and the resistance will change so that's why whenever you take the reading immediately we switch off we open the switches so then he says uh, in every experiment use the wire of the same material and diameter and make sure temperature of surrounding is always constant so what you will note down in the tables you will note down the length of the wire which is uh, being used uh, you will note down the reading on the voltmeter and you will note down the reading on the ammeter and then you will calculate the r the value of the r will be calculated that will be v by i so then I can draw a graph between the length of the wire and the resistance of the wire. So when you do this with the three, four, five, six, seven samples of different lengths of the wires, but the length will have the same material, same diameter. And then you can conclude, okay, uh, what is the relationship between the length of the wire and the resistance of the wire? So I hope you understand this. Let's have a look at the marking scheme for this question. Uh, marking scheme has been issued by the cameraage for this planning question. So number six, uh, circuit diagrams. Sample of wire must be clearly identifiable by a label on the diagram or by letter on the diagram with an explanation in the text. All circuit symbols correct, even if circuit is incorrect. Method, uh, method uh, two marks for the method. Take readings of V and I. Range of length must be between five centimeter and two meter with the largest length at least twice the smallest. Okay, so control variables um, are material, uh, resistivity, conductivity, type of wire, diameter, radius, thickness, cross-sectional area, and the temperature of the wire. Table uh, one mark, draw the headings, uh, for example, uh, length in meters, V, voltage, I, ampere and r is the resistance in ohms okay so this is that's it that's it so we are done with this so my dear dear students so uh, i can tell you uh, what we have done today so let me show you this this is the that 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 booklet and uh, we have the marking scheme in it i have uh, I have shown you the marking schemes one by one. So, so we are done with this. So today in this video, my dear students, we have done the practice planning questions uh, of the Cambridge O levels of physics 5054. These are this type of questions are coming in your ATP paper, which we call the paper four. And this is coming, they are coming in, they are being assessed in the examination, which are starting from May, June, 2023. And I hope uh, this video will help you to understand what type of questions are coming and how to plan an experiment. You know, it needs a basic knowledge of some science. That's it. So uh, I hope if uh, you have watched this video carefully, um, you will be able to do this. And uh, if you think that this video is helpful, if you think this video will help you, and this video can help your, your, your junior students, your senior students, your classmates, uh, your teachers please share the link of this video with all of them by sharing the link of this video onto your facebook onto your twitter account onto your instagram when you do this this helps me to promote my channel also like this video i think it's a great blessing for me that i can make these videos which can touch the life of so many students around the globe it's a blessing for me thank you very much have a good day god bless you all